diplomatic achievement. One of the great worries of, of people who are students of international relations was that in the process um, that Russia, the essentially the, the successor state, would feel humiliated. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of suffering, there was a rapid impoverishment of right. many uh, when, when all the subsidies were suddenly gone and the Soviet Union was gone. There was an opportunity for great uh, resentment and backlash amongst the population. How did President George Herbert Walker Bush manage the process with that in mind, sort of avoiding the humiliation that you saw of Germany after uh, World War I? Um, I think both he and uh, Secretary of State James Baker uh, showed remarkable empathy, not, not at every moment. They played hardball in a number of places, but they showed remarkable empathy for what Gorbachev in particular was going through. Um, but most importantly, they also made some promises, which the, the United States ultimately did not keep. The most important one was that NATO would not expand beyond the reunification of Germany. Um, and that, you, that would, the eastern part of Germany, when Germany reunified, could be considered then part of NATO, but we would not extend one inch eastward, uh, is I believe the phrase that Baker used. And Gorbachev and his team made, I think, a fundamental mistake at that point by not getting that pledge in writing. Right. It was an oral assurance made uh, more than once, um, and it's been the source of much dispute amongst Russians, Americans, and historians ever since. Exactly what we promised to do or not do, whether it was binding or whatever. Um, much trouble, I think, could have been avoided had uh, the Russians insisted that that pledge be put formally. It's possible we wouldn't have been willing to do that by the way, but I think they understood, that Bush and Baker understood, was that there was a limit that even though the Soviet Union was breaking up, uh, Russia was going to be a very weak country for, it turned out to be at least a decade, there were limits to how far you should push them because they weren't going to be weak forever. And as you said, if you fueled a very powerful sense of resentment, if they had the opportunity to try and uh, alter the circumstances later on, they might try. So the Clinton administration did make that decision, though, to expand NATO right up to the border of Russia and then offered, I forgot what the par partnership was called, Partnership for Peace, was it, that um, was, was to be our relationship with, with Russia. Do you have a sense of what went into that thinking at the time? Um, yeah, I think it was uh, a combination of things. Uh, and there really was a fork in the road in the early 1990s. Uh, the, Bush, the Clinton administration's initial policy, as you said, was partnership for peace, which was extended to the former members of the Soviet bloc, but also included Russia. And it involved many of the things that uh, NATO membership might have involved. There could be military to military cooperation, various ways to upgrade their uh, different militaries, working on civil military relations. It was designed in part to ensure that democracy would flourish in these places as well. It did not involve, however, an Article 5 security guarantee from the United States. These were not going to be members of NATO. We were not going to be formally committed to defending them. And of course, Russia was going to be involved in that. And shortly after that was the U.S. policy, we switched and we decided to pursue NATO expansion, beginning with Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. Uh, and that was an internal fight within the Clinton administration, as you probably r remember, that was ultimately won by the advocates of enlargement. And what they believed, and I think genuinely, was first of all, that this was not anti-Russian. They didn't intend this as a way of you know, containing a now weak and prostrate prostate prostrate Russia um, secondly that this would extend a zone of peace into Eastern Europe uh, that along with EU membership this would solidify democracy uh, here these states would have to conform to NATO's normal standards for being a democracy and that because democracies don't fight each other all right this would actually make Eastern Central and Eastern Europe more stable Right, and that would ultimately be good for Russia, too. Having stable neighbors to the West would be better for Russia. So there was a certain optimism. This is all going to be easy to do. It's all going to go uh, well. And what people, I think, forgot uh, was a more uh, sort of realpolitik view of this, that no great power really likes another great power pushing its alliances right up against your border because you never know what's going to happen uh, down the road and that once Russia was in a position to oppose that they were going to do everything they could to stop the process. Just one final point the second thing that NATO ultimately did which I think was a mistake was uh, to declare that this was going to be an open-ended process 
that there were no limits to how far we might take this. Uh, we were going to be careful about who we let in when, but ultimately NATO membership was an open door that any state, once it qualified, could be a part of. When you think about it, this is a highly revisionist strategy we're following. We're basically saying we're going to just keep moving this thing as far east as we think it can go, and that involves altering the local politics in various places. Um, and I think eventually this proved very alarming to the Russians, and they reacted as many people had predicted.